Williams, Marina, and I'll be lecturing on economics and development. So yeah, I'll just discuss like their applications in public policy, like on the latter part, just so it's clear. And a lot of the concepts I'll be discussing are just things that are important to note, especially in a round and I think would be helpful in debate. So economics is primarily about things like resource allocation, the free market, and especially if we're gonna talk about companies and corporate interests about profit maximization and efficiency. So the components are obviously in the production, distribution, and consumption of things. So a lot of things, especially like with regards to IR or geopol, are naturally going to intertwine with uh, those three components. People who are involved are obviously households or individuals, the government who controls a lot of these things and takes access and redistributes that into, um, let's say, government spending in the form of infrastructure or in welfare, and of course, businesses that provide the goods and services that people need. It's also important to note that both economics and finance or social sciences that are um, primarily involved as well in the behavior of people and how people react to certain stimuli like let's say for example taxation or how people the pattern upon which people spend and save money and the like so this is just like a visualization of the flow of income and spending uh, within a society than the supply and demand curve that I think a lot of the logic and economics is derived from so the free market, um, it's important to note that there's no like absolutely free market. This is just assuming a market with little to no government intervention or decentralized control. However, I think most countries do have some semblance of control because there's recognition that if you leave just like, for example, companies to price whatever commodity they're creating, however way they want, there does tend to have a tendency of them to price it in a predatory manner. So the government always has to be there. That's just an example, but they're like, other ways to do that, like let's, let's say like anti-patent uh, trolling, things like that. So the free market is also based on the supply and demand. So it's just assumed that the more of something there is, the um, cheaper it would be and the less of something, the more expensive it is. So financial institutions are banks aid in the flow of money. So they're integral actors, um, especially if you hear about like economic crises, like say the 2008 global financial crisis, the financial institutions played a key role in that or rather like caused it through malpractice and the like. But in a safer sense or like in their more, more ideal form, I guess, they're there for safekeeping and marginal growth of money through like interest rates. And they redirect um, that money from depositors into loans and investments to further stimulate the economy. So some issues with a free market, as I mentioned earlier, are with price controls, especially with things that are deemed as commodities, like let's say water or food or things that are necessary for individuals or important things like let's say medicine, especially now that um, there's a COVID-19 vaccine, for example. It also has to do with anti-competitive behavior, like let's say patent trolling or monopolies, although there are some cases of natural monopolies where it's just more efficient for one company to be handling it, like for example, grid lines for electricity, that's why it's um, common for only one company to um, focus in certain areas, like let's say Moralco and Metro Manila. Um, the third would be like, or the next rather would be like price fixing or companies colluding to ensure that they keep prices up so that people have no choice but to buy it at that price. So equity is another thing. So this is more common, or this issue is rather more common in highly socialist countries, like let's say Canada. So a lot of people who are deemed not productive by the rest of society are deemed to be receiving too much. So that causes tensions and rifts within that society. Although the state does have its reasons for giving those people um, something like, for example, unemployment packages or reparation packages for people who identify as First Nations in Canada, for instance. So the state always has its reason why they are giving that, but it doesn't mean that it does not come with certain um, ramifications or certain tensions coming from that society. So externalities are another thing that's an issue with the free market. So most notably is obviously the environmental impact of very industrialized sectors or industrialized states. Um, the public good or the people affected by certain policies or certain innovations. And of course, in terms of fairness and equality. 
So the GDP, um, and especially because this is like an econ and dev debate, it's important to note that GDP doesn't encapsulate the quality of life of people within a certain country. So that's why you have countries like China or India with very rapidly growing GDPs, but with high indices of poverty and um, some semblance of still extreme poverty in that nation. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that the quality of life of people is improving. It could just mean that more people are investing in that country, or it could just mean that the country is rich because they're producing more, they're exporting more, things like that. Um, so taxation, um, I'm sure a lot of you know, is justified through the social contract that you oblige with the state and their rules and you pay their taxes and in return the state grants you infrastructure welfare and grants you protection. So this also creates incentives for individuals. So for example, a tax break or a holiday is something that some countries give in certain economic zones. So for example, we have that in the Philippines in the Philippine economic zone. So the state supports this and wishes to encourage it. So for example, we're encouraging more multinational or foreign companies to enter and to set up here. So we give them a tax break or a tax holiday. A tax imposition like an excise tax or a progressive tax is something that discourages or attempts to equalize. So an excise tax is things that the state would like to discourage. So for example, trade law had that when they attempted to place this into the sugar sweetened beverages or to petroleum or to automobiles or even to tobacco and alcohol. Um, so those are things that the state deems as unhealthy and would like to discourage people from um, consuming. Um, Progressive tax aims to equalize. So this is wherein there's graduated rates of taxation, wherein the richer you are or the more capacity you have monetarily, the higher the tax you pay. So that's why people below a certain threshold aren't required to pay tax. People with a um, minimal um, income are only required to pay the smaller amount of tax or a smaller percentage of tax, wherein the extremely rich um, have to pay higher. Again, this varies from country to country. That's why there's a controversy in the United States that um, what do you call this? That billionaires are not being taxed enough. So those those are like um, there's certain nuances to each country's law, I guess, that make it unfair. Uh, yeah, or fairer or unfair, either way. <laughs> Um, so this is obviously channeled to public goods, ideally. So things like education, healthcare, or airports. So again, what constitutes a public good is highly debatable. So that's why people strongly support or oppose certain policies, depending on who they are. So it could be based on their socioeconomic class, your ideological or religious standing, things like that. So that's why in America, extremely conservative people refuse Planned Parenthood or healthcare covering, Planned Parenthood and abortion, things like that, because they believe that their taxes or um, the taxes that they're paying would be going to like immoral things and such. So that's why people have very strong opinions about where the taxes are going and how they're being used. So important terms and what they really mean. So one is just recession. So this just means two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, but the USA I just learned this in class. I'm unsure what metric the United States uses, but they use a different metric from the standard definition of a recession. So again, GDP is just like the formula I showed a while ago. So usually if there is a slump, like let's say a pandemic, wherein a lot of businesses close down, a lot of people stop spending money because those businesses are closed and are you know operating um, at like half capacity or less than half capacity, that's something that's going to be a problem. A depression is just an extreme recession lasting three or more years and at least 10% decline in real GDP. So real GDP as opposed to nominal GDP is just adjusted for inflation. So inflation is a decline in purchasing power of a certain currency. It's reflected in the increase of price of goods and services. So that means like, let's say the same unit of a peso, like one peso can now buy less things. So if a peso uh, this year can buy, um, let's assume a piece of candy then maybe next year, it's only like 25 cents that could buy. So pretty much like, yeah, it could buy less of something. So that's why older people tend to tell us like their tuition fee used to be like 100 pesos or like um, certain goods and services, like let's say food used to be a lot cheaper than it was now, things like that. So the opposite of this is deflation, where prices fall and purchasing power of that currency increases. So it's just the complete opposite of uh, inflation. So the CPI or the consumer price index is just the measure of the average change of price over time. So it's a measure of inflation. 
So it measures the sort of purchasing power of the country's currency. It includes people who are employed, self-employed, the poor, unemployed, and retired, but it often includes rural families, armed forces, or those in mental hospitals and prisons. So it tends to ex exclude people who are excluded from the formal economy. So it's also based on a basket of goods and services common to that population. So maybe the standard amount needed to live, like how much food costs, how much like rent or housing prices are. So this would again vary from country to country. So it's just, um, that's just how you compute it. Additional info though on finance. Oh, before I move on, like that CPI, I guess, some motions would call for you to have a certain policy or setup. So you can base it on a CPI or you can base it, like for example, um, a UBI will be granted. So you can say it's based on the standard of living or the consumer price index, things like that. So additional info on finance, because I think uh, it's like inevitably intertwined with economics. So a financial market is just an equity and debt security trading. So like stocks, bonds, derivatives, forex, those are the markets upon which these instruments are traded. The intermediary is just usually a bank, but there are different types of banks, like let's say commercial, universal, investment, mutual fund, and pension fund. So just common terms, a depositor is the person who deposits their money into the bank, the borrower or the debtor is an individual or entity who borrows money, and the creditor is just the one, an entity that lent the money to a debtor or borrower. So the types of banks are just like universal, which is combining investment, retail, consumer, and wholesale banking. Commercial is like, um, this is the most common, like it accepts deposits from the public and lends these funds to borrowers. Investment is an advisory-based financial transaction. And then wealth management um, is pretty much just like for richer individuals, I guess, wherein they help manage their money. Um, it's not necessarily all just, all just about gaining money. Some of them um, have a portfolio that includes philanthropy as well. So some banks and some wealth management officers do aid in that. And rural banks, which tend to cater to obviously people who work in the rural sector and um, try to help them save and give them loans for um, let's say fisheries or agricultural activities. So stocks are just ownership shares in a publicly listed corporation. So you may be entitled to dividends depending on the company and their earnings and it comes in preferred or common form. So preferred stocks are sold at a premium. So it's just a bit more expensive, but your yield is likely higher. And upon liquidation or bankruptcy, um, you are ahead of the common stockholders in terms of um, distribution of money. Um, bonds are just fixed instrument, fi fixed income instruments or an IOU. So generally, whoever the bond issuer is owes whoever the bond holder a certain amount of money. So this is usually very long term. Um, yeah, so it's treasury bonds, which are from the government, are generally regarded as safer than corporate bonds, which are issued by companies. So that's why national governments can also issue treasury bonds. Derivatives are just financial instruments which derive its value from an underlying asset. There's a lot of examples of this, um, especially from the 2008 crisis, like credit default swaps or um, mortgage-backed securities. But additionally, it is helpful like in the form of swaps or forward contracts or uh, commodities and such. So this is just a visualization of um, indirect, indirect finance through either intermediaries or financial markets. So second um, part will now be on development. So sustainable development um, is just a way for humanity to reach its current needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet theirs. So a lot of this is about just ensuring that the future of our, you know, you know of humanity or of our society has a world that they can thrive in. So Marquis Sen is just a nor Nobel laureate who is prominent in the academic side of development. So they coined the term like development as freedom and they claim that freedom is the primary end and principal means of development. So that pretty much means that development aims to empower more people to be free and to have choices, but it is also the primary means of empowering individuals. So they also claim that it's the only acceptable evaluation of human progress is enhancement of freedom. It's also like the achievement of development is dependent on the free agency of people. Next um, is just the participatory approach, which I think could help in a lot of setups or policies for development motions. So it also always involves stakeholders or people who, or anyone who is affected by certain policy or innovation. They involve them in both the discussions and the 
um, let's say like the dialogues happening in the decision making process. So that's why the key components are always dialogue, participation, cultural identity and empowerment. Um, so examples of this would just be like the relocation of refugees in Europe, where would they want to go? Is their family anywhere here already? Do they have relatives? Would they want to go there? Or even the commercialization and, or industrialization of areas that certain groups have a historical tie with. Um, were they willing to be relocated? If so, where would they want to be relocated? Obviously, you can't move a farming community to a community that's for fishing because their opportun like their capacities is not tied with that. So very obviously, um, I think you would be able to see that a lot of the innovations like in the Philippines do not use this approach and tend to just like do like whatever for the sake of profit and like leave these people fend for themselves. So ideally we should, or like more leaders and more development workers or people who work in the government should be practicing this approach and involving, involving the stakeholders, both in the dialogue and the decision-making process. So democracy and development, this is, there are like a lot of books about this. Like um, there are works by Sorensen and Why Nations Fail, which is a book, for example, that a lot of debaters read. So it's just the effects and impact of colonialism and imperialism to the global South and how weak and very extractive democratic institutions, especially in post-colonial states and less developed countries, hinder development from happening. So one of the closest examples, especially for us in the Philippines, is just patronage politics, which allowed for the formation of political dynasties that entrenched power in their regions or in their provinces in very weak check and balance systems because they have that utang na loob system, for example, wherein um, maybe if you're appointed by the certain president or your cronies or your friends with that certain president, and then you would be more likely to ignore their wrongdoings, even if it's your role in the different department or in the different branch of government to be the check and balance for them. So microfinance, so there are a lot of topics in finance and I'm just going through like uh, a lot of topics rather in development and I'm just going through like different subtopics that could occur in it. So microfinance just provides loans and credit to people who are otherwise excluded, especially from formal banking. So formal banking has certain barriers that a lot of poor individuals cannot reach. So for example, documentation, um, credit history, having a uh, baseline amount of money that they, they have to keep with the bank, for example, things like that. So uh, some microfinance institutions specialize in the needs of the community. Um, like for example, in Central and South Asia, it would be geared towards sanitation or the education of children or for the livelihood of individuals. They tend to do have higher interest rates because the logic is obviously um, these individuals don't have a credit score. It's more high risk to loan the money. Therefore, it can be justified through a slightly higher interest rates. And they tend to group or collectivize the credit system um, of those communities. So that's just a method of microfinance institutions um, to make it easier to collect debt. So things to note, there are no clear cut answers and solutions, perhaps only the most optimal ones. And obviously like very rich discussions can lead to that. And a lot of debates also revolve around what the most optimal solution would be. So development, be it in communities or countries always accounts for the context, including like the race, religion, culture, political climate, or even the history of these countries. So for example, that's why colonialism plays such a big role in the trajectory of development in a lot of post-colonial states. And it's also, also always important to assess the stakeholders involved in every development debate. Um, so just briefly on public policy. So for economics, obviously there's monetary and fiscal policy. Monetary is just headed by the central bank, involves money supply and interest rates and the value of the currency. Are they going to increase or decrease interest rates, things like that. Fiscal is the government spending and tax policy. So for example, austerity. Sometimes austerity is a condition like what the EU did or what the ECB did towards Greece because they were spending too much. So they had to ensure that they even if they were given like a bailout or a loan that they would not spend it too much. So there were a lot of restrictions on their spending ability. So it also influences macroeconomic conditions like aggregate demand, employment, inflation, and growth. Um, it also involves transactions involving that particular national currency. So the monetary policy, it's just expansionary and contractionary. So an expansionary monetary policy would mean that the money supply increases, but that happens, oh, never mind, it should be inverted. So the, if the interest rates are low, the money supply increases, or if it's contractionary and the interest rates rise, the money supply decreases. So this also in, 
um, involves the amount of money people have and their spending ability. So for fiscal policy, the method for expansionary fiscal policy is through tax cuts and increased government spending. This is usually employed during recession. Their goal then is to spur economic activity and increase aggr aggregate demand by giving the public more um, ability to spend. So that's why they reduce taxes. So contractionary, on the other hand, is the opposite. So it raises taxes and it lowers government spending and it's used to combat inflation. So their goal is to reduce the amount of money available for the public um, by making things a bit more expensive, like you see here, by raising taxes. So for development, there's just a lot of topics that are discussed in terms of public policy. So one of them would be development aid. What country should we take on loans from? Should it be the West? Should it be China? Should development aid be conditional? For welfare and infrastructure, what should be prioritized? Or should that be prioritized over giving like a universal basic income, for example? Um, conditional cash transfers, are these things that work? Or should cash transfers not come with conditions? Um, a UBI, should a UBI be considered and given in lieu of like, let's say welfare and infrastructure spending. Taxation is also heavily um, intertwined with development because a lot of the proceeds or revenue coming from taxation will be channeled into something else. Uh, yeah, so it's important to note that um, spurring or keeping money from taxation and being redistributed to something else is in indeed tied with development or even like, for example, the train package is tied with development because it aims to, for example, reduce like the number of automobiles in the metro, but is it being channeled properly by improving like the state of public transportation that's questionable, things like that. And of course, identities of people like their gender, their religion and their culture are naturally intertwined with development as well, especially in the global south or even in the global north or especially in conservative countries. Um, the trajectory of development for women is definitely different. Some of them are still, or like some groups of women are still excluded from the formal economy. Um, so yeah, your identity, like as a gender or religious or cultural or racial minority, definitely plays a part in the trajectory of your development and the development of that state. So thank you. That is all for the lecture. And I wish everyone luck in this coming PIDC. Thank you and bye.